Got 20 folks coming in. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fourth session of our uh, uh, Wilderness Summer Series. Um, we're gonna wait a couple minutes uh, for folks to file in, uh, and then we'll get going with some introductions and our presentation. Welcome. John, we should put on the, um, uh, the any future webinars. We need some music for the for the uh, startup time. <laughs> Agreed. I ended up opening one of the national WSI uh, sessions just to look at something really quick, and the music came on from that for those that maybe would have joined the national WSI. And I had a flashback to uh, listening to that song about a hundred times in a week, so uh, that was fun. Exactly. Exactly. It's great. We'll wait just one more minute, everybody, and then we'll get going. John, would you let folks in? Can you see the waiting room? I'm going to pull up something else real quick. Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome to our fourth session, everybody. Uh, this will be the final uh, session for the summer series. Uh, and we're, we're, we're going out with a bang here. Um, so over this last year, I think that everybody's noticed an, an incredible increase in, in visitor use um, in their wilderness areas. And uh, the thought from the planning team this year was to um, help people uh, think through how to manage that use. And um, so we gathered an awesome panel of folks to talk about uh, some of the areas that they manage and what they are currently thinking about and how they're, how they're managing that use um, as we uh, you know, increase in population, increase in use. Uh, there's both challenges and uh, opportunities there. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Title of today's is, um, session is uh, Popular Wilderness Areas, Management Challenges, and Potential Solutions. And joining us today is an esteemed panel of uh, wilderness managers. Uh, first, we have Alex Schluter. Uh, Alex is the uh, North Zone, or was the North Zone Recreation Program Manager on the Monongahela National Forest, and he managed uh, the, the Dali Sads wilderness, a sort of iconic Eastern wilderness. Um, and he has since moved into another position on the Coconino National Forest. So thank you to the Coconino for lending Alex for a couple hours. Um, we also have Lisa Jennings. Uh, Lisa is the recreation program manager from the grandfather ranger district on the, uh, the Pisgah National Forest. Uh, and 
Lisa manages Linville Gorge Wilderness. Uh, it is uh, one of the Eastern Wildernesses that was included in the 1964 Wilderness Act um, and has an incredible, it's an incredible resource and it is very well loved. And so I'm excited to hear from Lisa today. Uh, and then finally, uh, somebody from outside of the, the East, uh, we have Katie Nelson. Uh, Katie is the Wilderness and Trails Specialist on the Aspen Sopris uh, Ranger District in White uh, River National Forest in Colorado. And she manages the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness, which is an incredibly popular area that we're excited to learn more about. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, really excited to hear about these special places and what you're doing to protect them. So. Let's uh, kick it off. All right. Thanks, Eric. I think that that's my cue, right? I think so, yeah. <laughs> can you let me know when you can see the screen? All right, perfect. Yeah, as Eric mentioned, I, I just moved to Arizona, but my name tag still says Monongahela, so, so that counts, I think. <laughs> so I'm going to talk today, or we're going to talk today. Here, let me see if I can flip this slide. There we go. We're going to spend about 15 minutes each, the three of us on the panel, to give you a little bit of overview, for, provide some context to what our wilderness area is like and the challenges that it's facing. And I think you're going to see a little bit of difference between the stage that each of these wildernesses is at. You know, eventually you get slammed with visitation, and what are you going to do about it? So you'll see, see a comparison there um, between the three. Uh, so yeah, after the context, then the comparison comes uh, about the management approaches that we're choosing on each of these units and what we're pursuing and, and what the differences are there and how effective we think they may or may not be and what resources it takes to implement them. And then lastly, we left plenty of time for discussion, hopefully get some audience participation um, and answer some of your questions and, and have some good back and forth. So I'm going to talk today about Dolly Sod's Wilderness. These are my two cousins I took out uh, last July, had a magnificent trip, um, managed to avoid the crowds on a weekday, actually a three weekdays, a Monday through Wednesday trip. It is possible. And this is a really cool landform called Lion's Head that's very popular. And as you can see, it does actually look like a lion. So you can tell why it's so popular. So Dolly Sod's, what I'm going to talk about specifically are the way I see it is there's different layers of complexity that set it aside from some of our other wilderness areas on the Monongahela <clears throat> that make it just a little bit more complicated, um, even on the Mon, but then versus other wilderness areas elsewhere in the nation. Talk about specific issues and challenges, and then what direction we're going to, to tackle those challenges. So the first layer of complexity is just easy access. The Monongahela and specifically Dolly South's Wilderness because it's on the north end is very close to numerous urban areas and I listed here the drive times from the, some of these places and uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen New York license plates up there. Um, six and a half hours is not much of a barrier to the millions of people that live up there, but I'd say the majority of the, the visitors that are there overnight are, are going to be coming from Pittsburgh, Baltimore and DC those closer ones. It's a pretty quick drive down the highway. And people are coming not just for backpacking, not just for your typical recreation, but they're also horseback riding, looking at wildlife, berry picking, taking pictures of fall colors. If you are familiar with Dolly Sods at all, you're probably familiar with the fall scenes that where the blueberry bushes and other bushes turn red, and it's just fields of this glorious red. And it lasts for about two weeks, and it's, it's absolutely magnificent. And we have weddings. So you, if you want a very unique experience, one of a kind can go get married in the Dolly Sods area. <laughs> and as you can tell, I took these all from online. That's just what was posted publicly available. That's only a drop in the bucket, I'm sure, compared to how many actually get married up there. I was told that one Saturday there were three weddings happening simultaneously. So that's, that's a lot. The second layer of complexity is that this wilderness is not alone. It's surrounded by a mishmash of partners, different land management agencies, private organizations, 
And so when people say the sods, which is the nice name for Dolly sods, they may or may not be talking about the wilderness. They might be talking about that whole area, which, which adds a lot of complication. So you've got the Forest Service and the wilderness, which was the southern portion was designated in 1975 and then expanded just a, a little over a decade ago to add the northern portion. <clears throat> but beyond the Forest Service, we have Canaan Valley National Wildlife Refuge. We have Canaan Valley Resort State Park. And we have the Nature Conservancy property, Bear Rocks Preserve, which is extremely popular. This is where you get very easily accessible areas where you can take gorgeous photos of sunrises and sunsets. This is just a small snippet. I mean, I've seen hundreds of gorgeous, gorgeous photos. And people get confused, like I said, about where they're at. So this very unscientific way to look at it. When people put on Instagram, hashtag Bear Rocks, you know, these are pretty accurate, that's bare rocks. But when they put hashtag Dolly Sods, there's a heck of a lot of bare rocks pictures, which is actually outside the wilderness. That's our nature conservancy property is bare rocks. And then hashtag Dolly Sods wilderness. A couple of these, these ones right here, those are definitely bare rocks. They're not actually in the wilderness. And this guy on the motorcycle, I hope he's not in the wilderness. And then beyond the public land, we've got two ski resorts on the west side, one a downhill ski resort in Timberline, one a, a cross country in white grass. And we also have neighborhoods that's around the area uh, on two or three sides. So again, when somebody says the sods, they may or may not be in the wilderness. Another layer of complexity is the endangered species that are there. Um, we've got cheap mount salamander. I won't show you the habitat, but suffice it to say, they're all over the place. So we gotta make sure that this listed threatened species is protected. And historically, the last layer of complexity is that there are bombs out there. Yeah, you, you heard that right. Um, unexploded ordinances from World War II, when it was an artillery range, there are still some bombs out there. So when we find one, we call the Army Explosives or Explosive Ordnance Disposal, EOD unit, and they come help us to remove it. So the last one that was found was in 2018, I believe, 2018 or 2019. And it was in the northern portion, and we had to clear the trails within a certain distance and close off those trail intersections and make sure people weren't there. Luckily, or maybe unluckily, the weather was terrible, so we didn't actually have many people. I think we only encountered four or five people, um, but it was, it was cold and rainy, uh, which is very common up there in Dolly Sods. So again, four layers of complexity, I think that set it apart from your average wilderness area. So getting into the management challenges, I grouped these into, into four sections. So the first is traffic. There are roads, Forest Road 75 on the east side and Forest Service Road 19 on the south side that are the main access points. And then there's one Forest Service Road um, that goes through the wildlife refuge on the west side. And these red points are where we really have quite a bit of congestion. This west side with the wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service, they have a parking permit program for overnight that they enforce pretty strongly, but it's a little bit more wild west uh, out on the Forest Service roads on the east and south side. And here, this also borders private property. And so we have people, we have problems with people parking in front of mailboxes and they end up getting towed. And then that's the last thing a visitor wants is to get back to the trailhead and not have their vehicle. So that's a, one specific area. <clears throat> Another one is Blackbird Knob Trailhead on the east side. As you can see, when folks park on the side here with the vegetation, it's really hard for two-way traffic to get by. So when cars try to get by each other, they can't, and they end up getting stuck facing each other. And if this, this parking parking's happening for a long stretch, that tends to back up and really cause traffic jams. And the worst part, worst part of the road that that happens at is up here near Bear Rocks, near the Nature Conservancy property, near Bear Rocks Trailhead, and Beaver Dam Trailhead. And as you can see, these cars are facing separate directions and it backs up and, and causes a, a significant problem. The second major group of issues is just impacts to campsites from visitation. <clears throat> if everybody followed Leave No Trace, it probably wouldn't be a problem, but, the, but they don't. And as you can see, these are the, some of the impacts, trash left behind, vegetation being cut, and I don't know whether to call this artwork or construction. I don't really know what these are, these poles that people put out there. You never know what you're gonna find up there. 
related to campsite impacts and solitude, which is our next group, um, is that people tend to concentrate around water. We have two areas that are just known for their good camping um, opportunities, lots of established sites, lots of fire rings, um, and folks just tend to just congregate here. So on a Saturday night, you might have, I don't know, at least a hundred different sites within a quarter mile, and they call this the forks. This is Red Creek that comes here and it splits into the forks here, two different forks of the river. Also related to that is that folks tend to follow this exact same path. So this is a very popular website that comes up when you Google search backpacking Dolly Saws and folks coming from DC, Baltimore, these urban areas, they do their research, which is good, but they tend to end up on this page and follow the same patch where they start path where they start at Bear Rocks, do this loop, see some really gorgeous sites. But the issue is if everybody's following that same path, those folks are going you know, to struggle to get solitude. The other group of issues uh, that I'll talk about is poor trail conditions. And that's really throughout the wilderness. Um, there are some notorious trails, the worst of which is Dobbin Grade. And I took some screenshots from Facebook. These are all describing Dobbin Grade. Um, we've had struggles with beaver dams that tend to make it a uh, flood and leading to pretty darn poor trail conditions. So again, to summarize, those are kind of the four groups of issues we're dealing with up at Dolly Sods. So let's just get into what do we do? I took more screenshots here about some of the suggestions. Some are great suggestions. Some maybe it would be more difficult to implement. But the point I want to put out there is that people are really genuinely interested in helping and giving a hand. Um, they really care about this, this area. So we as managers, just one of the things we need to keep in mind is how do we Take that energy and funnel it into positive ways to approach these challenges. So one by one, um, for traffic and parking, Monongahela National Forest recently established a Dolly Sods Wilderness Stewards Program in conjunction with the West Virginia Highland Scenic Conservancy. Um, so this is a program where we're going to have multiple roles for volunteers, but the Highlands Conservancy is going to be the organization that helps to advertise, recruit, and actually organize those volunteers kind of on our behalf in collaboration with our guidance to make sure we're all on the same page. But some of those roles, um, specific to traffic and parking, one that will be, I think, very effective uh, is to have folks at trailheads that are kind of wilderness greeters. We call them trailhead stewards. And they're going to talk to folks that have just arrived. Um, maybe if they see them parking, kind of talk to them and see if they could get a little bit further off the road to make sure that we keep the road clear. But really the main point is to express leave no trace principles and teach people, uh, especially the new folks that have not been back in before, how they can have a good time, but also be cognizant of their impact that they might have when recreating and how to mitigate those impacts. They'll also talk about wilderness ethics and safety, things like rising waters, Red Creek, for example, if it's raining at all, there's a good chance that if you crossed it yesterday, the water might be rising and it might be significantly more difficult to get back across. Here's just a screenshot of uh, a posting they had on their website. <clears throat> but I have a lot of optimism for that group to grow and to be very successful in the future. The other part about traffic and parking is our wilderness education plan. A lot of folks who come up to the sods don't understand what wilderness is, don't understand the level of development that's expected there. All they hear is Dolly Sods is a great place to go visit. You got to do it. Mark it off your, check it off your list on your trip along with Seneca Rocks and Spruce Knob and all these other great locations we have on the Mon. But they don't even ask. They just assume that there's going to be bathrooms, there's going to be people up there. Things that are at these other locations, they just kind of group them into one thing and then they get up there and they're very surprised. So our wilderness education plan, one of the things that could potentially be effective with is getting the word out of what to expect, that it is a very low level of development and to hopefully lead people to prepare more or avoid that area at all if they're, if they're not prepared for it. And in the future, potentially, we can think about strategic parking prohibitions where maybe we prohibit parking on one side of the road just to maintain that two-way traffic flow um, potentially improving parking, but specifically I want to say not to expand it. If you expand parking significantly, you're probably just going to expand visitation. 
And when uh, it comes to solitude, that may not be the best choice long term. And then lastly, we have to partner with Tucker County because down here, the county that this area is in, this isn't a forest service road until the intersection that, that's right at the trailhead. And we have folks parking on county road. So the forest service has limited jurisdiction over what it can actually do to address that problem. So it needs to be some partnership. For solitude and overcrowding, you're gonna sense a theme here for all of these. We're gonna try light handed with the education plan and with our volunteers, and then try to get a little bit more for uh, heavier handed if things continue to, uh, if you continue to fester. So the education plan, definitely we can promote folks in there to say, for example, try to avoid that loop that lots of people are doing uh, that two to three day, three day trip where they're all doing the exact same loop. If we can just tell folks that that's extremely popular and if you're seeking better opportunities for solitude, try some of the other trails because there are spots that even on a Saturday uh, remain pretty darn quiet in Dolly Sods you might be able to better disperse that visitation. And then monitoring. Uh, this year, the hope is to install trail counters at the beginning at, at all the trailheads, along with voluntary registration logs that West Virginia Highlands Conservancy is gonna help us monitor. And so we can start to collect the data we need to understand exactly how many people are we seeing and where are we seeing them go in. And then uh, lastly, actively talking about the, to the Nature Conservancy about balancing the need to have day use at, at bare rocks and that, that great opportunity with what we can do long term to, to manage that visitation. In the future, again, the parking, uh, the road, put installing road counters to understand the road use as well, and then trying to disperse outside of wilderness as well. Those are some of the considerations. For campsite impacts, those trailhead stewards and the education plan, again, that's all about increasing the knowledge of visitors, increasing their skill set. A place that has 10 visitors that follow or that don't follow Leave No Trace is going to be in much worse shape than a place that has 100 visitors that do follow Leave No Trace. So we're really hoping we can be effective with that. And again, monitoring, understanding where we're seeing issues and to better target where we want to put our resources. In the future, potentially increasing presence and enforcement. Lastly, for trail conditions, Right now, just trying to figure out how we can do basic maintenance with, without having an effect on that cheap mountain salamander threatened species. It's pretty darn important for us. Uh, and then recruiting volunteers to help. Long term, taking a broader look and coming up with a rehabil rehabilitation plan where we might close routes, we might reroute areas that are perpetually wet. And that's a lot of work in a wilderness. Um, we definitely have to do minimum requirements, decision guides make sure we mitigate our impacts to the wilderness character. But in the long run, I think more sustainable trails will be better for wilderness character. And lastly, just to point out a, a few tips that we have to keep in mind on the Monongahela as we go forward, is figuring out how to fit recreation projects within our larger Forest Service NEPA processes. It takes some strategic thinking years ahead, years in advance, and bringing our partners along with us again funneling that, that energy into positive outcomes. That's kind of the goal. And then um, considering ways to disperse wilderness. And like I mentioned, using minimum requirements, decision guides, or just minimum requirements analyses to make sure that we're minimizing that impact to wilderness character at every step of any of these approaches. It's really important. So the end goal is to have as great a trip for everybody that we had, me and my cousins. All right, I believe Katie is up. Wow, Alex, uh, great job, I learned a lot. Um, yeah, tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, perfect, okay, so what I'll do is um, I'm gonna segue into the Maroon Bell Snow Mass Wilderness and you all just have to give me one second. Um, Okay, I'm going to rely if, if folks can see a black screen and a slide if someone would let me know that would be helpful. Looks good. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, so first, before I dive in, I just want to share that I'm on the traditional land of the Ute tribe who have stewarded this land for generations long before I've come in as a blip on the radar in a wilderness stewardship role. So I want to start with that before I dive in to the Maroon Belt and the Mass Wilderness. Okay, there's a great scenic photo of a beautiful spot um, up in the Maroon Belt Snowmass Wilderness. So um, I'm in Colorado and shout out, I saw in the chat a couple of other folks from Colorado here, some familiar faces and names um, and someone just over the hill in Twin Lakes. So that was neat to see. But for folks who aren't familiar, um, there's the lovely state of Colorado and that green, green amoeba is the Maroon Belt Snowmass Wilderness. Uh, Central Colorado in the Elks Mountains, and you'll see some of the larger metropolitan areas, um, Denver there and that whole, we call it the Front Range. Um, we see a lot of visitation from, from that area. Over 50% over of our overnight visitation comes from that kind of greater Denver area. Um, and then here's a little bit more zoomed in. Um, you'll see in the center there, if you can pick that out, uh, that is the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. Um, it's about 181,000 acres or a fifth the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> I had to laugh at that because I, I don't have a good concept for how big Rhode Island is, but if that makes sense to you, we're about a fifth that size, 181,000 acres. And then if you can see there, we actually have a couple of neighboring wilderness areas, some of which are on this district as well. So the Ragged's Wilderness, um, the Collegiate Peak, the Holy Cross. So a lot, a lot of wilderness areas and acreage um, in this area. And then finally, the, the classic scenic photo of this is looking into the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. Those are the, the namesake Maroon Bells. And um, this is one of the most photographed spots in North America, I've been told. Um, so it's incredibly popular and for good reason. Um, this is one of the, um, like uh, like the Linville Gorge, um, this was one of the original 1964 wilderness areas. Um, okay. So I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Um, I, I think sharing a little context of history with the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness will provide context to some of the um, specific management actions we are in the midst of here um, in this area. So um, I'm just gonna quickly share what you're looking at. Might be a little bit overwhelming, but this is a visitation trend in the Marine Bell Snowmass Wilderness from 2006 to present. So that's what you're looking at along the bottom. And then the individual lines of different colors are visitation numbers from different trailheads. And if you pick out something here, what you'll note is that there are some very specific areas where visitation has what has been determined to be significantly increased in the last 15 years. Um, to look at it a different way, this is um, the visitation trend over that same period of time, but just combining those individual top 10 trailheads into one metric. So just two different graphs that show this visitation trend that we've seen over the last 15 years. Okay, so is that a problem? You know, and I, I always say that, and uh, I'm not asking that facetiously. You know, we've, we've seen this increase in visitation. Is that a problem? Um, you know, is it impacting wilderness character? And so I'm going to show you a couple of pictures taken in the wilderness here. Um, these are some things we're seeing out there. And um, this is a near conundrum hot springs. Um, this is in the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. You'll see quite a number of tents. You'll see some fairly impacted areas and that um, tree damage in the front there. Um, this is a campsite out along the four pass loop. Um, this was a pretty typical scene at Conundrum Hot Springs. Some people may see that as crowded. Some people may think that looks quiet, but that is a snapshot of a busy weekend. Um, this is on one of our popular trails, the Four Pass Loop. Definitely, we have kind of the Congo line headed up, um, all overnight visitors there. Similar to Alex, um, some interesting parking, uh, parking strategies, if you will. Um, if you see in the background that Jeep like pulled way up, um, pulled way up, kind of up past the trailhead. 
uh, definitely folks getting blocked in, towing cars, parking in private property, et cetera. Again, familiar to probably many of you. Um, human bear interactions, human wildlife. Um, this is in the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness in, in one of our particularly bad years. Um, very unfortunate. Bears getting habituated, bears doing what bears do, getting habituated to food. And that year in particular was bad, we, including having someone attacked by a bear, bears euthanized. So um, definitely escalated to a pretty um, concerning point. Human waste, sorry that it's graphic, but um, ton, a, a lot of human waste issues. This is uh, Jerry, one of our awesome wilderness rangers, just with trash that he packs out. So I, none of this would be a surprise to any of you, but just to kind of usually show some of the things we were dealing with out there. Um, and then, you know, just another metric in four years, wilderness rangers packed out over 3,000 pounds of trash, literally a ton and a half, and be buried nearly 1,500 incidents of poop, exposed human waste. So that's that's the history. And then not just us seeing it, you know, here's an article from a local paper, if you can see at the bottom, um, it essentially says, uh, over the course of a few hours, volunteers loaded an entire trash bag with human waste. Um, here's the Denver Post talking about it, um, Colorado Public Radio, <laughs> Denver's 5280 Magazine, uh, an article from 2007 in the Aspen Times, our local paper, High Country News, and even um, Vox. You know, this is talking about some of the issues with, you know, 7 million subscribers. So it wasn't just us seeing this, right? Like, I think that media is just indicative that others were noticing how much of a problem there was. So fast forward a little bit, um, and there's a ton of work that went into this, but in 2017, through an incredible amount of work from some really inspiring people, um, the forest adopted the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness overnight visitor use management plan. And the goal of this was, you know, to, to speak very generally, to protect and restore the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. I mean, this iconic original 1964 wilderness area where you were seeing the pictures from before, um, not, the, the area was not being stewarded to the level that we, the public and the law, um, decided that it deserved. So this plan was adopted to protect it. Um, to address over 30 years of documented deteriorating, deteriorating natural conditions as depicted by those photos. Um, this plan, it's adaptive, it's data-based. I'll speak to that quickly later on. Um, it includes the ability to implement limited overnight permit systems. That's the, there's a lot in this plan, but that's, that's what people, what, what's most notable. Um, this plan, it's comprehensive. It allows us to manage overnight visitor use. And specifically, the public gave us the blessing to implement limit, limited overnight permits. And the public supported it. They basically asked us to do better, um, very understandably, and just robust public support um, for this plan. So before, before I go any further, I think it would be remiss to not share some of the tools that went into this. And I share this in every one of these presentations because I want folks to be aware of tools that are available to them. Um, and, and the people involved in this overnight plan utilized this tool specifically. And it's a product of the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council. And it's a framework for visitor use management. Um, it, it allows you to you know, scale your project big and small, um, you know, everything from like a simple, what maybe is a simple issue to a large, complex, controversial project. Um, it gives you some tools to, um, you know, invest commensurate effort and resources with what you're dealing with, big or small. Um, and it, it really gives you a framework for how to think about and walk through um, visitor use management challenges. Um, this slide might be overwhelming, but you know, in this in this previous slide, you'll note on the right, it it walks you through a plan, you know, starting with the why, building your foundation, um, and then moving through, you know, what what are you going to do? What's your visitor use management direction? What are some of those management strategies? And then finally going out and doing it, <laughs> um, which is what I'm, that's the piece I'm heavily involved in right now. 
um, just one more thing on this I want to share. Uh, again, I think I, I would not be doing it justice. We're, we're talking very specifically about a permit system, but I can't stress enough that a permit system is just um, one, one tool in the belt and it's arrived upon after a comprehensive visitor use management planning effort. A permit system is not visitor use management. A permit system is one tool nested into a larger effort. And I'm very visual, folks who have seen me talk before have probably seen this, but I like to think of it as the nesting dolls and the permit system is nested into visitor capacity, which is nested into a comprehensive um, planning effort. Okay, so um, I, I shared kind of that history and context of where we landed. And I shared that we, we adopted that plan, which gave us the, the ability to implement a limited um, overnight permit system. And what you're looking at there is the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. And in the bottom right, that, that um, solo gray zone is the Conundrum Hot Springs zone. And so we went forth after that plan was signed and we, we implemented a, a limited overnight permit system in that area. So I'm gonna talk through some of the lessons learned and, and, and what, what's come out of that now a couple of years later. So I would say um, overall it's a success and I, we can talk about pros and cons and trade-offs, but we implemented it and um, you know, I'm, I'm showing, because I showed the media just kind of sharing the issues and the problem, you know, we had some similar media outlets report after the permit system, a, a positive change. Um, and so that was exciting. That was exciting to see. And anecdotally, we observed that visitors were, um, were happy with their experience um, and we were able to, to make some improvements in some of those biophysical impacts that we were seeing and were really the, um, the purpose and need for this, this effort. Um, this one I share because this was the same outlet that basically said, this place is trashed um, and the, the trailhead's a mess, there's human waste everywhere. And this one was neat. Um, it just um, talks about a drastic drop in some of those things we were dealing with. Okay, so you're probably wondering, what's working and why, and that might be why you joined us today. Um, so I'll try to share a little, uh, there's, there's so much more and I welcome people to reach out to me, but we'll just talk about a couple pieces of that permit system, planning effort, management tools, and why I think they're working. Okay, so first um, we implemented that overnight permit system in Conundrum Hot Springs. Um, the permits are only available online. Um, we don't issue them at ranger stations. The only way folks can get them is online through recreation.gov. And some of you may be saying, well, shoot, um, they're not gonna get to talk to a ranger. They're not gonna get to go into the forest service office. And what I'll share is I had those same concerns. And I think, you know, I think the reason why this is a, an effective tool for us is um, one, it allows us to use our limited resources elsewhere, i.e. our wilderness rangers are not in an office issuing permits. Um, similarly, um, it's consistent messaging. Um, the, the message on the website is consistent. So anyone who wants a permit goes to the same place to get it. Uh, so I think that's been a benefit there. Um, and then the additional piece is um, we were able to, excuse me, at an informational video. We partnered with Leave No Trace to, to put a video on that permit website. And if you can see down there, it's had over 16,000 views. That's a huge success to me. That's nearly everyone who gets a permit to Conundrum Hot Springs watches this video. And because we partnered with Leave No Trace, the messaging in there, um, I think it's really high quality, way better than I could have ever done. <laughs> um, so that's, I think, a tool that's working for us, um, that we have that information on the website. It's a one-stop shop. And we have um, information in a medium that people enjoy, a video. I, I would prefer to watch a YouTube video rather than read tiny font. The other thing I'll share is a success. And again, these are things we did in conjunction with the permit, but wouldn't have to be necessarily related to a permit. We combed third party websites and we reached out to them and shared the information we wanted people to see. 
so this is all this is all trails but i'll give you an example we were up on a hitch up to conundrum and a visitor said i didn't know i needed a permit i even looked online and we said okay um where did you look and they said all trails right not everyone uses a forest service website we said okay we we want people to be set up for success and we know not everyone uses a forest service website so we literally googled conundrum hot springs and and contacted all those third party websites to say hey will you share this information we want we want people to be set up for success before they arrive and we have to have a hard conversation with them okay so that that again just to summarize there that's the one stop shop of the permit website and some of the um, ways that people get information on there. Okay, so camping impacts, um, you know, what's working, you know, in this case at Conundrum, um, we have 20 what we'll call like sustainable or viable campsites. And this picture is in the overflow. So essentially, people would go up to try to get one of those 20 campsites, those would be full and they go down into this overflow area. And I understand why. I mean, I, at that point, what else are they going to do? Um, with that permit system, because now we've limited it to 20 permits um, for each of those sites, we've been able to go in and rehab a bunch of those areas and actually think that it's going to stick, <laughs> um, which is great for the wilderness rangers in the group. It's the most frustrating. You rehab a site, it gets reused. You rehab, it gets reused. And it just feels like you're beating your head against the wall. But with this permit system, now we can truly um, have some success rehabbing some of those areas. Um, and it's because we have, we're, we're sending people to these um, places that we've deemed acceptable for them to camp. Um, we're focusing those impacts into those campsites and then we can gain some ground on some of those other heavily impacted areas. Um, as an ancillary benefit, um, we do have people reserve a campsite number and go to that site. And that was a tough decision because we didn't wanna limit people's freedom in wilderness. However, what we heard was that people were racing up the valley to get a site. Um, and that didn't seem like the best experience for them either. So we did decide to um, have them reserve the site. And we heard from folks that that allows them to enjoy their eight mile trip up an amazing glacial valley. So not without trade-offs, but in that case, I think it allowed us to achieve our resource goals and some um, benefits to the wilderness experience for some, maybe not for all. Bears. Um, <laughs> we're in a much better place, and this is not necessarily because of the permit system. It's because we instituted a requirement for approved um, food storage. Um, and so we're in a much better place there as well. Um, we, you know, it's not something taken lightly, but as I described earlier, um, based on the severity of those incidents, um, we instituted a special order requiring approved bear food storage, which for most people is a bear can. Um, and so lots of work with partners in the community and local retailers renting and selling them. Um, we have a free lending program at our ranger station. So again, you know, it wasn't just the special order, although that allowed us to do some enforcement, which was a piece of that, but really um, getting the word out, helping people understand why it was so important and working with our community and partners, which is not easy, right? It's it's hard to do that. We're busy, and um, but investing in the community and working with our partners to get the word out and to provide those items to be available for the public was a huge success. In addition to, we did a lot of heavy enforcement. Um, so just kind of the full suite of, of tools in the belt from kind of heavy to light handed and using them all in conjunction. So there's some bears I'm not getting into <laughs> a tent. Human waste, sorry again for the graphic photo, but um, we utilize um, wag bags or human waste bags at some of our popular trailheads. Uh, this has also um, been successful at alleviating human waste issues in some of our high visitation areas. So that in my mind is a success, but I, again, I, I don't wanna candy coat it. There's an expense. Um, we spend probably five to $10,000 a year on these bags that we provide free to the public. Uh, so that's definitely a consideration. The, the boxes have to be stocked. Um, people have to know how to and be willing to use them. And I, we are partially able to accomplish that with messaging on our permit website where folks can, if they're not familiar with the concept, they'll be introduced to it and have a chance to think it over before they arrive and grab, grab one at the trailhead. 
Um, and the other thing with these, I, I'm always torn and I, I again, I wanna be transparent, they're landfill waste, right? It, it solves our issue in a local spot, but these do end up in a landfill. And so I, I won't pretend they're a perfect solution, but they did allow us to, to make some ground in some of these areas. Um, you know, this picture, this is a little extreme. And I put this in here because the common conception is that we actually have less people up there now. And we actually accommodate more visitors than we did prior to the permit system. And I think that's a surprise to a lot of people. And hopefully this graphic will help, um, help explain that. So this is just a snapshot of visitation prior to the permit. And what you'll see is spikes and those generally correspond with um, busy, popular, well sought after weekends in the summer. And so what we had before was these um, large spikes in visitation and folks going up there and that's where we were getting a lot of our um, biophysical impacts, right? More people than, than campsites, new campsites created in addition to the other um, potential impacts um, that we see with overnight use. So after the permit system, what we saw is those spikes went down, right? Uh, we're only allowing 20 groups up, um, but those troughs rose. And, you know, again, it's a trade-off. And so what we're seeing essentially now is we're just filled to that capacity um, on most, day, most nights throughout the summer. So it's interesting. Um, I think that's surprising to many that, oh, there's less people. And in fact, no, we accommodate more, but um, in a way where it's sustainable for the number of campsites up there. So there's certainly some trade-offs. You know, for me personally, what I would think is, oh, geez, now I can't go up on those quiet weekdays. Um, so again, just something to consider. Um, and then finally, this is something I share with this. Um, here's a, a spot in the conundrum trail that, um, we deemed needed some work and we were able to accomplish that. And what I always say with the permit system, it's not less work, the work just changes. But in this case, it allowed some capacity for our rangers and trail crew to spend some time lower in the valley doing trail work rather than just up at the hot springs kind of continually chasing their tail with all of these issues that we've described. So it does in some cases open capacity to do other work. Um, and then back to this picture, um, we're still in the same place. Some of these other areas in the Maroon Belt Snowmass Wilderness um, are still very um, in need of, of action. And so I'm right in the thick of implementing in some of these other areas. This slide might be overwhelming, but if, if you'll note, I said earlier, it's very data-based. And if you look at that picture on the right, the red essentially indicates overcapacity, overcapacity, way more groups than campsites. And that's truly what we're trying to get a handle on is those biophysical impacts. So just the tip of the iceberg. Um, finally, and I recognize that I'm a little bit over time, um, but before I hand it off, I just, I, I think this is an important slide to share uh, with the group because what often happens is I present this and people say, I need a permit system, I need a permit system, we gotta limit use. That may be the case, but we came to that after years of work, comprehensive visitors management planning to say that's the tool we wanna use. And so I just wanna end by sharing this. Um, this might be a good tool for folks to use if, if they think they're in that same spot and they've gone through you know, a bigger planning effort. These are some good questions to ask about. Um, is a is a limiting permit system going to um, be the right tool for you? So the first question there, and I, I was this is from 1989, and I um, Linda Marigliano shared it with me, and I think it's still a really relevant um, tool to use. So the first question to ask yourself is, you know, if you're considering a limiting use permit system, is there agreement on the resource and experience conditions to be achieved? i.e. do you know where your compass is pointing? Do you know your goal? What are you, what is your goal for that space? And is there agreement on that goal? And if not, that's okay. It just means you need to do more, more planning and um, working with internal and external partners to say, our goal is this. In the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness, it was 
let's get a handle on biophysical impacts, i.e. camping impacts that are impacting the natural conditions. And that has allowed us to move forward with agreement on what we're trying to do. Um, the second, there must be agreement on acceptable levels of impact, and this is hard. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not going to look the same for every area, um, you know, and I think people have to ask themselves hard questions on acceptable levels of impact. Is it just because it's you personally and you've, you've seen that change over time, or are those impacts um, truly not in line with the management and legal direction for that area? Um, number three, there has to be a clear relationship between use levels and um, resource or experience condition. And what that means is you need to understand or be, or be relatively sure that, that the amount or type of use is impacting that desired resource or experiential um, goal or condition. Um, so for example, you know, with the bear issue that I mentioned earlier, a permit system is not going to fix an issue with um, human food storage and bears. It could be part of it, but, but there has to be that clear relationship um, between the desired condition and use levels if you're going to look at the permit system. Um, four, use levels must be a more important factor in causing the particular impact than visitor behavior or site location. Similar to number three, um, a permit system doesn't fix visitor behavior. It may give you a method to provide information, but a permit system doesn't fix a human waste problem or a bear problem. Um, so that's it's it's tempting, but and it can be a part of it, like I said earlier. But you have to make sure that there's some sort of correlation. Um, agreement. I, it, these are all very similar, but agreement on what will be achieved by rationing use. Again, this is just a reminder that there has to be the goal has to be clearly stated. There has to be clarity and purpose and need. Um, this one, number six, agency must have the resources to administer use limits. And this is just a hard truth and it likely resonates with a lot of you. Um, I've talked to many managers with a permit system, including Lisa, that um, the permit system loan will not fix it. You have to have the resources to back it up. And right now we are outreaching a fee because we know that um, we don't have the long-term financial viability to support all of the services that are needed to have a successful permit system. So this is the hardest one. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure it resonates with some of you. And then finally, um, just there must be agreement that the established use limit represents either the maximum or optimum number of people. And I say this is, I say this, but I would say that what I would add to number seven is, Yes, you should have agreement about what you think that optimum number of people are if you're going to limit to that number or you know type of use. But better yet, I say just build in a mechanism to fix it if it's not right. And in, in our particular plan, it's adaptive. And we say, we think these are the right numbers. We think these are going to achieve the goal. We have a lot of data and rationale behind why we landed there, but we built in the ability to adapt because we might not have it right or you know, we might have missed something. And so I always say that it's never going to be perfect. And, um, you know, ideally you agree on something, but you build in some um, ability to adapt. Okay. I'm going to go through my lessons um, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Lisa to talk about an area that's um, a lot further along in the permitting process. And then just hear some of the um, successes and challenges that they're working with there. So thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to get here and share my screen. Um, so thank you for kind of the introduction, Katie and Eric and Saws for hosting this. Um, I think between Katie, Alex, and I, um, the most fun of this presentation is that we've been able to connect and learn from each other because we're all in very different places. 
And um, Linville Gorge is, is a different story with all the same themes that you've heard before, um, but maybe a longer history of figuring out um, what we're doing right, but also very much uh, what we need to improve upon. So. Hey Lisa, um, real quick, you're, you're in um, a different mode for the slideshow. Oh. Uh, I can see your, your next slide in notes, so. Okay. Yep, hold on one second. I just need to um, switch my display settings if I can get my mouse over to my other monitor. Just gonna try to start this presentation over. All right. Um, I would say just stand by for one second. <laughs> Let me get this over. Oh, there we are. Okay. All right. Are we? Um, no change. Are we now, did it change? Not yet. Okay. It says my screen sharing is paused. Um, resume share. Okay. All right. We should be up and running now. Uh, same result. Okay. Maybe um, share and share again. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try that. The uh, you know, my monitor's connected here to my laptop, which is um on a different screen. So I'm gonna try one thing here, which is turning off my monitor and resetting my screen. Apologize, folks. Um, there you go. Okay, you can see it now. All right, start that again. <laughs> All right, so um, I manage the Limbo Gorge Wilderness, which is on the Grandfather Ranger District of is the National Forest. And um, we are just east of Asheville, North Carolina, kind of where the foothills meet the mountains. And that's one of the great things about the relief of Linville Gorge is it's really that entry point into the mountains. Um, so at its basis, it's a gorge, right? And um, comes with all those opportunities and challenges that managing a gorge has. Um, you start out on the rim in pretty much every case in visiting the gorge. And you can hike along the rim um, to see beautiful views of the surrounding areas, or you can hike it down to the river. Um, this was probably uh, taken in an aircraft flying over the wilderness, which is not recommended, um, but gave a good perspective and wanted to point out there's the road on the right-hand side of the screen, that's a state road. And I'll point that out in the next map, but just how accessible Linville Gorge is um, for visitation, which leads to some of our management challenges that I'll review. So Linville Gorge Wilderness is about um, 12,000 acres of wilderness. It started out with 9,000 at the initial um, designation in the 1964 Wilderness Act, and there was a big chunk of um, over 3,000 acres added in the early 80s. There are 13 separate entry points into the Linville Gorge Wilderness area. Um, kind of really uh, broken out into a west side that is accessed along the state highway, Kistler Memorial Highway, which is a gravel road that runs the whole west side of the gorge um, with about eight trailheads from that side. And then the east side, which has a little less road access, but has some points that you can get to almost entirely on pavement. Um, and the, the, that side has some of our really popular destinations like Table Rock, which is actually outside the wilderness, but views it and Hawksville Mountain, which is probably our most popular day site. Um, we're surrounded mostly by general national forest area, but not entirely. 
The north end of the Limbo Gorge Wilderness backs up to Blue Ridge Parkway, which is administered by the National Park Service. The Linville Falls you know, attraction, I'd probably call it, is an international destination, draws a lot of tourists to the area. Um, we also have neighborhoods that back right up the wilderness boundary without any national forest in between on both the north and south side of the gorge. Um, so very accessible, um, very easy to get to a lot of entry points, um, and also very close to a lot of population centers, in particular Charlotte, North Carolina, which last I heard is the fastest growing urban area in the southeast. Um, so this is a, a huge urban area. You can actually see the Charlotte skyscraper skyline from the south end of the wilderness area. It's a little over an hour drive from Charlotte to the closest point in the wilderness. Um, but we're also really close to Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area with all the universities. We get a lot of young folks who are in the area at those schools coming up to the wilderness. Um, about four hours from Atlanta, close to Knoxville, Tennessee, really kind of all that East Coast population centers. Um, and as you're driving west um, or north, from the foothills and the coastal plain, the grandfather district is the first national forest land you hit at the edge of the mountains. And Linville Gorge in particular is kind of the, the highlight and the hotspot of our district that draws people in. And so if you're looking at, you know, closest place to camp in the mountains, um, Linville Gorge is it for a lot of people. Um, and I knew a lot of people when I was in school in Raleigh who would say, oh, haven't you been up to Linville Gorge camping? It's really close. And, you know, two hours was really close um, in that case. Um, so good thing we have a five-star review here on Google, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's uh, something that we deal with just that proximity to populations as East Coast wilderness. So I'm just going to flip through a couple of things just to talk about what makes up the character of our wilderness. Um, you have the river, the rushing Linville River, which is the reason why we have the gorge here. It's um, rivers that are not typical to the East Coast, more of that Western style with the huge boulders, the size of buses. Um, when the water gets really high, it's um, world class um, whitewater kayaking through the gorge. And then along the rim, um, there's these amazing rock formations going up a thousand feet from the bottom of the gorge. This is the prow rock formation in the amphitheater, which is one of the most popular backcountry climbing locations on the East Coast. Rock climbing is a huge historical use of this area. Starting in the 1950s, we have the first documented use of fixed anchors within the wilderness. Well pre-wilderness. Um, and so that's a, a continuing popular use and also um, a big source of search and rescues within our wilderness. And then beautiful mountaintop destinations. This is the top of Hawksville Mountain. You can hike a little over a mile from a parking area and get this view into the gorge. And if I were to turn the camera, you would look west into the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Mount Mitchell, the highest peak in the east. Um, very easy to get to some of these really amazing wide open view spots. Um, oops, sorry, the text color is <laughs> really poor there, but um, what it says is federally listed plant species. And so in this beautiful landscape, we have actually two federally listed plant species, but I'll focus on this one because it's endemic to the grandfather district. It's Hudsonia Montana or Golden Mountain Heather. Um, it occurs on the eastern rim of Linville Gorge and one other small population and that's it in the world. Um, the picture on the left with the flowers, I've never actually seen it in bloom, although I've tried many a time. What it really looks like in the right is that tiny little patch of green 
um, closest to the cliff that looks like all the other little patches of green. It's like a tiny little patch of pine trees. And it looks like the mosses that grow on the rocks that aren't rare. And I like to um, say that it is a view dependent species. It grows right on the edge of cliffs where the best views are. So you imagine people like to walk there. Um, and where there's not a canopy. And so it's really associated with the fire history of Limbal Gorge, which um, has large scale fires about every five years, um, both historically and even currently. And we have a, um, the largest amount of lightning strikes in North Carolina in Limbal Gorge. So lots of fires that contribute to these views and maintain the species. Um, but the two major risks to these species are lack of fire and human trampling. Um, and so on these beautiful views, this is definitely a management concern that we deal with um, a lot is how are we impacting the Hudsonia in those places. This um, view is at Wiseman's view. And I just wanted to kind of point to the fact that at wilderness designation there, they were very thoughtful with how they drew the wilderness boundary. And this um, viewpoint is outside of the wilderness, which is why it has development. Similarly, the big flat mountain across this view, Table Rock, the summit of that is outside the wilderness area. So it provides opportunities for people to experience the Linville Gorge wilderness without being in the wilderness area. And as land managers, it gives us some options to focus people to non-wilderness areas to meet those experiences with less impact to wilderness character. Um, they're also just really beautiful spots. So all those weddings on Dali Sads, we tell them to get married right here on Linville Gorge, uh, at Wiseman's View if they're coming to Linville Gorge. Um, not everybody listens, but it's nice to have that option. So I think just seeing the pictures, you can understand why people love Linville Gorge. It's close, it's easy, it's breathtakingly beautiful. It's the Grand Canyon of the East is what, what folks call Linville Gorge. And so we get a lot of visitors. Um, this is the data that was taken in 2020 by our SAWS Wilderness Ranger, Nick Anderson, who's on this call. Hey, Nick. Um, and looked at average encounters per hour. So we've been doing solitude monitoring under um, the Wilderness Stewardship Performance Program and then um, implementing that on an annual basis um, above and beyond what's required under that program just because we want to understand how that high visitation is affecting solitude. So this, I will say 2020, um, thank goodness, was way more busy than 2021. We have seen visitation go down somewhat, um, but it's still higher than it had been in the past. And so that bump we got in 2020 with the pandemic, um, probably never gonna go back down, right? That bump just increased us more. Um, we do have areas where folks can get away. You see Conley Cove and Babel Tower here relatively low visitation. So Nick was out for four hours. Um, on a weekday, he'd see about one person per hour and on a weekend about four, you know, reasonable solitude. But other places, in particular Hawksville and Shortoff, we're seeing uh, a much larger increase in visitation. It's in accelerating in these areas. Um, so, you know, 23 people in an hour on Hawksville. Um, that's that one that I was saying you could hike up to in an hour. And so we get bigger groups, more people. Um, we do have a group size limit of 10, but you know, we're seeing, you know, families of six, some not everybody follows that limit. Um, and so just a lot of folks coming to enjoy this area. So challenges, I'm just gonna talk through briefly these challenges and then really focus on some of the creative solutions or maybe things that we're trying to accomplish. Um, a lot of our challenges are the same things you've heard, trash, um, always trash, people leaving brand new tents, you know, big deal. Um, also trash that is maybe more unique to Linville. Um, there was a, 
entire finishing plant upriver that in the 80s um, started throwing the tires that they couldn't use into the river, which then washed down into the wilderness area below it. Because the Linville Wilderness Area doesn't protect the headwaters, it's just the lower portion. Um, so volunteers pulled out about 300 tires several years ago. Campsite proliferation, um, with all that use comes a lot of campsites. Um, we see that in popular areas. Um, we have hundreds of campsites in Linville Gorge. Some are concentrated in areas. We also have a lot that are just spread out across um, across Linville. Parking issues, I don't have as good um, parking fix as the other folks, but um, same thing, you know, we, we, we manage capacity somewhat by trailhead capacity. And so Hawksville has capacity for about 10 cars. Um, and on weekends, we're, you know, having to play parking attendant um, to try to control flow through the road so that um, when we get those search and rescues that happen so often, about twice a month, um, they can get their emergency vehicles through. Another really interesting challenge we've had and, and use of the wilderness, um, which, which is an opportunity, I think, and a challenge is this um, slack lining or high lining. So rock climbing has always been popular. Um, we get a lot of groups that come to Linville Gorge now at certain times of year to walk tight ropes over thousand foot drops. And um, really interesting to see, but you know, questionable of whether those folks even realize they're in the wilderness at certain points. And then we've had some damage to rare plants and to vegetation associated with that. And here's a picture of a lot of high lines and something called a space net, which was new to me, um, strung up and um, nobody was even there when I saw this. And so we've had a lot of talks internally about what justifies a permanent structure versus a temporary structure in wilderness and how do we manage for an emerging use like this, which obviously if you walk on something like this, that's affecting your wilderness experience. Um, but from an enforcement standpoint, it's, it's unclear exactly how we enforce that and, and what our response is. So um, the way that we deal with challenges in Linville is through partnerships. And um, that's me in the middle. And these are two special folks um, who represent two special organizations. Um, saws and wild south. And um, it's a lot to wrap our heads around what's going on in Linville, especially since I am, I'm not a wilderness manager. I, I mean, I am the wilderness manager for Linville, but it's not my only job. Title. I'm the recreation manager. Um, and so Linville is just a part of what I manage. And I have a staff of mostly just seasonals, really um, small. So we really rely on our partners in this area. Um, Stephen Aaron, who's up here, used to be our wilderness ranger um, for many years in Linville Gorge, works with SAWS um, and now works with Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And then Kevin Massey on the right with Wild South, um, who's a longtime resident of the area, um, executive director of that nonprofit and runs a lot of our volunteer work. Um, so everything that we do revolves around how we work with those two partners because we have very, very limited capacity to do things internally. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through kind of three areas where we focus. And the first is permits. And this is kind of to follow up on Katie's new permit system, what it looks like when you have a very old permit system. Um, and this picture, I say permits and enforcement question mark, because this is the picture of our law enforcement officer retiring. So we are um, currently without any law enforcement. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna show that to keep that in mind and, and thinking about permit systems and what that means to any kind of, of enforcement of these rules that we've set for ourselves. 
um, which when they were created, nobody would have been able to, to know what our capacity would be like um, 50 years down the road. So just a timeline of our designation and permit system, because it is a, um, a really old permit system. And I don't have any data to say that it's one of the oldest in the country, but I'd imagine that I would be pretty correct in that assumption. Um, in 1964, that designation came in, and in 1966, we um, had a draft of the first wilderness plan. Um, very quickly, um, that permit system, a permit system was implemented in 1972. So only six years after that first plan, um, managers were starting to see that use was outpacing their expectations for the wilderness. In 1972, they went into this kind of trial permit system, which was just an unlimited use permit system to gather data on visitors. And everybody who went into the wilderness, they had this registration station, say where they're going, how long they're staying, what they're doing. Um, in theory, from that data, there was the implementation of a limited use system in 1974. And that limited use system was a 130 day use permit spread out um, between east side visits and west side visits and only 30 overnight permits. I um, will share a little information on a couple slides um, after this about some documentation I found on why they picked that, but a lot of the documentation and that knowledge of why our permit system is how it is has been completely lost from record. Um, so we just try to put those pieces together to help understand. Um, there is a visitor use management study that was used and that took place though in 1978 post implementation of the permit system and looked at um, Limbo Gorge, in addition to Shining Rock and Joyce Kilmer Wilderness Areas, um, the two other high use wilderness areas in the state, um, and actually found people were having a really good experience with solitude in Limbo. In 1984, those additions came in. And then in 1986, the Wilderness Management Plan was revised um, to reflect those additions and changes in management. There is no documentation of exactly when the permit system was revised, except to say that they were planning on revising it within the new management plan. What changed is that the day use permits went away and it, they increased the number of overnight permits to 50 and changed it so that those permits are only required weekends, May through October. We have had the same permit system in place since the mid 1980s. Uh, so 35 years, um, we have had this permit system in place. And interestingly, the first time I could find when um, the um, person in my position started uh, complaining about not having enough resources to enforce it um, was in about 1996, where they said that um, they could no longer hire seasonal wilderness rangers because of lack of funding. Um, so this lack of enforcement and lack of funding and resources for the permit system has been about a 20 year problem. Um, going back to why that 70s permit system came into place, you know, similar to some of these modern practices, um, looking at basically doubling over what they thought was that sustainable level or that carrying capacity. Um, now there was no, um, no really specific visitor use management study that took place in the 70s. The only documentation that I have is this permit plan that basically said that it's losing its wilderness character and something has to be done. Um, and then I have a folder with a bunch of complaints about the permit system. And, um, and it really kind of helps me understand through the reasoning that were um, in those response to those complaints, why the permit system was in place. And what it said was that basically they looked at miles of trail, water course distances, miles of river, 
camping sites and rock climbing areas and related that to other wilderness studies to determine this number. So not quite as scientific or rigorous as the processes we have today, but you know, a, probably a good process. Um, and then this was another piece of documentation from my file in the 1980s where there started to be that identified need to change the system. <laughs> And interestingly, um, you know, they talk about it's hard to enforce, um, but also there was a lot about they're tired of all the complaints, you know, constantly angry public all the time. Um, but then also understanding that the additions in the wilderness took place. So the situation changed, more trail miles came in, more acreage came in. And that's all I have about why the permit system is how it is. And so I'm trying to piece together some pieces of history here to understand why we are where we are. Um, but what I know is that right now, we still have this somewhat outdated permit system, which is better than no permit system, but it's not enforceable given our current constraints. Um, we have, um, Folks who love and work in the wilderness, but not in that law enforcement capacity. Our wilderness rangers through our partner organizations cannot write tickets. They, we have the information that compliance may be between 10 and 30% for our overnight camping permits, very low compliance. Um, and the way that we had been enforcing them when we had law enforcement is basically they would go to a trailhead late at night you know, after dark, take license plate numbers, then come back in the morning and wait for those people to hike out. Um, because we have not had a lot of capacity for law enforcement patrolling within the wilderness. Um, we do have great trail crews, which are um, these ladies here um, were one of our trail crews a couple of years ago. Um, but we're not hiring people specifically for Linville Gorge and we're not hiring people who necessarily have uh, forest protection officer certification when they come on. So that just makes it very hard to have that level of enforcement. I would say our enforcement is episodic at best. Um, so really looking at how do we modernize our permit system, um, we do all of our permits over the phone or um, in person at an information cabin. So looking at them online, um, sorry, my text got all messed up on these, so it's a good thing I didn't have a lot of text. Um, so the other thing where, you know, we might need to think about is um, as situations change, how do we revisit our numbers, types of reservations, and then, you know, looking at other places that are, are having a fee for their wilderness reservations, what would that add to our capacity? Um, also, just within our existing system, how can we better enforce this? So, right, 13 wilderness entry points is incredibly hard to manage. Um, we've talked about parking hang tags for permits, so you could drive by a parking area and check a permit in a car and then write a ticket based on a license plate without having to be everywhere in the wilderness. Um, but that has its own problems in terms of we get a lot of people who do. Uh, star photography, sunset photography, you know, all of the things people like to do at night in the woods. Okay, so permit systems, I know folks are interested in that. I will say we're not doing great with our permit system. So here's some stuff we're doing really good with. Um, education is one that, um, especially through our partnership with SAWS, and we've really been able to create some really great educational products and be able to talk to folks where they are in the best way we can. We view the permit as an educational tool and every time somebody gets a permit, they get this one sheet, leave no trace paper um, that talks about um, all the things you should know when you go to the wilderness. We also have created these um, wilderness portal information signs working with our local search and rescue folks, because that is, um, as I said, about two times a month we get search and rescues. 
Um, and so really um, putting in those points of um, needing to prepare for your experience and drilling that home. The other place where we've done a lot of work is around engineering is what I call it, which I know is weird for the wilderness, um, but I would say it's really social engineering. Um, doing small things that are compatible with wilderness character that make a big change for a lot of visitors. And a lot of time that plays to our trail system because that's how people, the majority of people, 99% experience the wilderness is through the trail system. Through our partnership with Wild South, we've um, worked through a basically mapping exercise through LIDAR data, high resolution, hill shade, and Strava heat map. Um, and I'm gonna go through just a little bit of information about this because it's cool. Um, this is LIDAR, right? You can see the topo, you can see everything, the old road beds. This is looking down at Bynum Bluff where we recently had a forest fire at the north end of Wendell. And then this is Strava. So um, for mountain bikers, trail runners, my husband uses this a lot. Strava is the fitness tracking app of choice and you're tracking your trail runs or your hikes or even our OHV users use it. Um, and then there's these freely available heat maps that show use patterns. And so this was in the news a while ago because of some military base. They could see where the military base was because the um, the folks in the army were tracking their fitness runs around the military base. Well, um, our partner queued in on that and we started digging in and you can see everything on the forest. And so the darker the line is the more use, the lighter the line, the less use. Um, and you can overlay that with your trails and see where people are going. You can also overlay that with LIDAR data and really see where people are going. And I love this one. This is Hawksville. Um, you can see there's a, a little arrow in the middle where the old trail was. We had a reroute um, back there about 10 years ago. And you can see nobody's using the old trail, which is a success. Um, and how many people are using the new trail? You can also pick out trail braiding at the summit. So this is helping us cue in to some of those management issues. So we know there's trail braiding at the summit, two trails where there should only be one, um, impacting the natural character. And so we work with our volunteers, which we have a huge volunteer energy in Linville Gorge um, to improve the official trail with some steps, stone steps to make it appealing, to block off access to other areas. And we go from trail braiding two trails to one trail with this stone step project. And I simplify the stone step project because it took like a year and lots of grip hoist and rigging. Um, but you can see from the Strava data comparing years, they do it on an annual basis about the impacts of that management and that social engineering, is making something appealing to a visitor to get up to the summit. We've also used this for a um, trail planning effort in Linville Gorge. We have a lot of uh, trails that are in poor shape, really, really erosive trails, you know, huge scars on the landscape. And we're able to look at um, Strava data to find old trail beds that might make more sense um, instead of cutting a new path, to look at where user created trails are. Um, and to understand where people are going in those patterns and be able to move people through the landscape where, where they can do the least damage. Um, an example that we're working on currently is we can see this is a couple trail intersections. And we had to put a sign up here. And I really don't like putting signs in the wilderness, but we kept getting 911 calls and emergency management asked us to put a sign on this intersection on Hawksville. Um, and so one of the things we can see user traffic through there, they get lost and they go to these social trails. Um, and so we're looking at LIDAR and Strava to help us make this decision to make a 
small relocation in the trail that will allow us to remove that sign from the wilderness. And so both of those things have an impact. The trail construction short-term impact, the sign would have to be maintained there for a long time. And we're up there replacing that sign every couple months. And the last example I have to show is how we are using this to manage that interface between wilderness visitors and the um, endangered species, Hudsonia. Um, so this basically allows us to target and know where we need to go. We can overlay Strava use data with this rare species occurrence polygons that we have from our botanist. And we can see where visitor traffic is going into areas of endangered species. And then we can use that social engineering to have a couple volunteers with grip hoist moving some rocks to block the path to these invasive species. The user's experience in that place does not change, um, but they're not walking on the endangered species anymore. And we're doing our job under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and also reducing social trailing, which, which is a problem in our wilderness area. So really cool stuff. Um, we, in Linva Gorge, I found that we have to focus where we can be most successful and where we have the most energy. And so as much as we'd love to be better at enforcement and being out there, sometimes we just can't. And the place where we can be successful is these partner efforts and where we can make the most bang with our buck, which is really cool thing about Strava is we can really focus on the places where we can make a difference. All right, and I also talked really long. So um, I'm gonna turn this back over to Alex and we're gonna kind of start off the interactive discussion portion and, and compare and contrast our wilderness areas. Okay, so, um... We've got three charts here, really three broad types of management strategies. And you can see examples listed there to just give you an idea of what education, engineering, and enforcement actually might contain. And we thought we'd go one by one um, and kind of explain where we feel our unit is at on this scale of one to five, one being minimal or no resources put toward this type of management, and five being maximum effort. We got partners on board, everybody is on board with whatever this effort is. Um, and we have a little symbol that represents, a cute little symbol that represents each of our wilderness areas. So the Monongahela Dolly Sods Wilderness represented by the salamander, Cheat Mountain Salamander. Uh, maroon Bells is the maroon mountain seen there. And Linville Gorge is the little tree. So Lisa, if you wanna go to education, Quickly, uh, Dolly Sods, I put right in the middle because uh, we are, we have a Facebook now in the Monongahela National Forest that we're using to get Leave No Trace information out. We've got the volunteer wilderness trailhead stewards out there talking to people. And then we've got our wilderness education plan in the works. So it's, it's at a two or three, I think, and it is trending upward. Yeah, and for Linva Gorge, you know, I think we, I, I just say we're kind of in the middle, right? We have this great partnership with SAWS and with our wilderness rangers. We have an information cabin that serves wilderness visitors for kind of on-site information. Um, and we have all the trailhead information that we've developed over the years, but definitely still room for improvement and doing more. And then for the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness, um, after, after my presentation, I actually think we're doing more education than I recognized when we did this. Um, but specifically those that I'd point to are the opportunities for engagement with the permit um, website. Uh, we do uh, retail clinics with the outdoor gear stores. Um, and then we do a fair amount with um, third party websites. And then we do, we're fortunate that we do have wilderness rangers and trail crew out on the landscape interacting with visitors. Um, I'd say where we could improve would be, um, you know, our social media presence and our forest service website presence, and then um, just continued interaction with, with um, different partner groups within the community. And I think at this point we want to launch a poll, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's do it. Paul, uh, do you want to you want to um, 
introduce it and just kind of set it up? Sure, I, I can do that. So, like I said, on a scale of one to five, um, how much does your own unit, whatever unit that might be that you're coming from, and if you have many, I guess just pick maybe the busiest one. Um, how do you much? How do you? How much do you rely on education? And I'm starting to get responses rolling in. Um, about half of the folks in the room have, have weighed in. If you haven't weighed in yet, go ahead and weigh in. Right in the middle. It's good to see that everybody's doing some level of education. Yeah. All right, we'll end the poll here. And yeah, like you said, Alex, we're right in the middle. Uh, Nobody doesn't rely on any education or we're solely relying on education. So that's good to see. It's a multifaceted approach to, to management here. Oh, and I think I just shared. Okay, now you all can see it. Um, anything else to say about that, y'all? Yeah, I think we had just kind of a note for folks to, you know, if, if there's something creative you're doing around education, you know, type that in the chat box. We're going to go through these three examples and then we want to hear from folks on those creative solutions to visitor use management in the wilderness and, and maybe, you know, come out of this with a list of some great ideas to take home. Great. All right, Katie, I think this one's you. Can you hide the poll, Eric? Oh yeah, certainly. Lisa, I had your name on this one. I was going to do enforcement, but I'm oh. happy to trade. No, I I got this one. Okay. okay yeah. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So engineering. Um, so we, we are talking about engineering in terms of signage, trail changes, parking, those kind of physical changes that you're able to make in that wilderness context um, in order to manage visitors. Um, and so um, I will start with Linville Gorge. So I had us kind of on, on the high end with this, all of those virtual things we're doing to make the small changes we just approved um, NEPA for a trail system, um, Linville South End restoration, where we're doing trail relocation. So really that's where we focus our energy in Linville. I can go ahead. So for the Monongahela, we're kind of on the opposite end. Um, and I think that makes sense because out of the three wilderness examples here, we're the most recent to get this huge bump in, in visitation and engineering being a heavy, heavier handed approach might come a little later. So we do have signs at trailhead intersections um, for safety because we do get lots of people um, that rely on our search and rescue resources um, so that we have that. And then there's a lot of things pending um, or under consideration, those parking prohibitions and changes that we might make uh, that way. So I had us pretty low on the scale of maybe 1.5 or two. Yeah, and then speaking for the uh, Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness, I would rate us higher on um, uh, utilizing engineering techniques. And a couple that I would call out, um, we have, you know, like Lisa said and Alex, there's, I just wanna acknowledge that there's always trade-offs and I, I'm thinking all of this with wilderness character in mind. Um, and I'll, I'll share a couple that we've utilized um, that I think are a little more outside the box. So. We published a map of campsites for the four pass loop, which is an incredibly popular loop. And it's essentially recommended campsites on that loop. And some of us struggled with that because we, you know, it, it felt like providing more information than we wanted to. And yet it's, an, it's a kind of an engineering technique that occurs outside the wilderness where folks who are researching that loop can find that map with um, GPS coordinates and we vetted it to say we're, we're okay with folks camping in these locations and so that's an engineering tool we've used to direct people to campsites that um, 
we would prefer they use rather than those that are right on the trail, on the water, areas where there's boreal toads, et cetera. So I think that's one in particular um, that to me was, it's, it was not my idea. I can't take credit for it, but I think we've seen some benefits from that um, rather than having signs out on the trail that says camp here or don't camp here. Um, I, I would say in addition to that, um, uh, some of the, the parking things that we've done, um, you know, that you would be familiar with just boulder placement, instead of a no parking sign, there's a boulder there. So it makes it hard for someone to park there. Um, those are a couple that come to mind, but I, we have utilized quite a number, including um, designated campsites within the wilderness, which again, there's pros and cons to that. And we've got uh, about half the folks weighing in. Uh, I've had plenty of time, so I'm just going to end this poll and share the results. Again, um, seeing mostly moderate reliance on engineering, probably because everybody's using the combination of the three. Um, and we'll go to enforcement. Okay, and I'll jump on this. Um, so for the Marine Bell Snowmass Wilderness, um, we're definitely higher on the enforcement side of things, including we we do have a number of special orders in place, including the bear, the food storage in the context of bears that I mentioned. We do have a limited use permit system in addition to um, uh, non-limiting required registration elsewhere. Um, we do have a fair amount of staff presence out on the landscape. So I would say um, we are also on the higher end of enforcement style um, management practices. And I'd say for Linville, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, put, I put myself like all the way on the end, um, but we do have a permit system. We have a group size limit. We do have these rules in place. Um, but enforcing them is, is where we struggle. So we, we've got the tools, we just don't have the resources to use them appropriately. Monongahela, uh, we do have a group size limit of 10 on all our wildernesses. Um, and we do for Dolly Sods on those forest roads of 19 and 75, there's no camping uh, within 300 feet of the road. So we do have some regulation not well enforced we don't have any wilderness rangers um we and we certainly don't have people up there friday evening when folks are pulling in so it's it's difficult to enforce the few regulations we have and we don't have a permit system oops so yeah just um seeing folks weigh in on the poll and for any of these you know we encourage if anyone has any um, outside the box or things that they've seen work or things that they're utilizing, please pop those into the chat, whether they fall under education, engineering or enforcement. Um, like we said, part of this, I think is just sharing ideas and, and learning from each other. So please, please pop them in the chat. And what I'm seeing here is um, folks are generally falling into don't rely on enforcement, don't rely on enforcement or low level reliance on enforcement which would be an interesting discussion topic, right? Like ideally, if your education and engineering are functioning, that maybe you would have um, less need for some of these enforcement or as Alex says, heavy handed. So it's interesting just to, to see and please, please pop in the chat if folks have anything they wanna share on that topic. All right, and then this final, you know, this this idea of education, enforcement, engineering, as Alex and Lisa and I were having awesome discussions in preparation for this, um, we were talking about this tool, and so I, we just kind of popped it on at the end, but just another way for folks to think about it, and this was introduced to me, and it was really helpful for myself and others on my team to think through um, all of these you know, actions or in some cases, non-actions that we're, we're doing in these areas. And so the idea is that it's this um, triangle of compromise. And um, when looking at these actions or thinking about these decisions, what was really helpful for us is to think about that proposed management action or tool in the context of impacts to the visitor 
So how will that impact the visitor, their experience, their ability to visit, et cetera? And some people will know that as the social setting. Um, thinking about impacts to the resource, right? In a lot of our cases, that's the designated wilderness area. So how will what we're doing potentially benefit wilderness and um, the qualities of wilderness character or what, what um, pieces of those actions might potentially compromise that resource? And then the other piece is the agency. Will that, you know, will we be able to manage manage that that strategy, or will we will we be able to open up some capacity, or will although it's a good idea, will it completely tap our ability to um, manage that area? So we just wanted to introduce this as a tool, another way to think about those things. And now I'm sure all of you like going through the ticker tape of um, what Alex is working on and Lisa and some of what I've shared. You can kind of think about all of those um, challenges and then some of those solutions that were offered and how those solutions kind of fit as far as how those um, impact the visitor, the agency and the resource. And in a perfect world, it's a win-win-win, but that's not always the case. And so this, this can be a tool for conversation and thinking critically about um, your visitor use management strategies and tools. Great, thanks, Alex, Lisa, and Katie. Um, we we're, we're at the uh, end of the presentation, and we you know I think there's a lot of information to take in. And uh, before we jump into these discussion discussion questions, uh, I'd like to open the floor with these last uh, you know 15 minutes uh, to see if there's any questions that have come up um, and and comments or anything like that. Uh, go ahead and go off mute and uh, and say it or type it in the chat. Um, I realize that some folks may not be able to come on camera or uh, uh, maybe talk out loud in in the area that they're they're viewing from. So, hey Eric, Pete Irvin. Hey Pete, how's it going? Great. Just um, a point to to Katie. Um, I may be the only one, but maybe some others also interpreted the inf our responses on the enforcement question of not how much enforcement we might want to do, but how much enforcement is is realistic to expect, and maybe that's why that one's so low. And and then I just throw out thanks to all three presenters, and if we have time, I, I'd love to get the presenters' takes on the impacts on the untrammeled quality of wilderness character in their high use wildernesses. Thanks a lot. Pete, putting y'all in the hot seat. So uh, how about the untrammeled quality of wilderness character, um, you three? Oh crap, I took my mic off first. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's a good point to bring up. I mean, that triangle of compromise, that's the resource side, right? I mean, the for wilderness character, that's important. Is everything that we're doing actively out there that's probably going to be a trammeling. So, like I said earlier, I mean, balancing that or trying to use the minimum requirements analyses to make that decision and take that seriously, because it's really easy to not think about it and shove it to the back of your head and be like, this would work, this would work, this would work and not think about, okay, if we can do it, should we do it and, and go to that deeper level? Um, yeah, it's, I think there's also a difference between your gigantic 4 million acre Western wilderness and Eastern wilderness, you know? Lisa, I love that picture you had where the road is literally on the ridge line. And I think there's probably a slightly different standard that you probably have to take into account uh, depending on your, your wilderness. And when it was designated as well. Yeah, and I, you know, in in all the work I've been doing with trails, especially, I think about this a lot, and that balance between untrammeled and natural, and um, and some of the things that you know high visitation bring. We really have to be selective. So. I think about in, in Linville Gorge, we used to have this bridge that crossed the river and they put it in because they thought people needed this bridge for search and rescue. And 
Um, now we're, we're taking it out, even though we have more visitors than we ever had, um, because it is such a huge trammel to have that structure in the wilderness and we haven't seen that big impact. And so I think when you're looking at those trade-offs where we can find them in, in, in the way where, where you get the biggest bang for your buck, right? Because with high use, comes more action from a manager standpoint. And, and I think that's what we all struggle with every day. Yeah, uh, Pete, great question. It's, I also think about it a lot. Um, and I was trying to think of, of examples within this permit system where I think we are taking actions that would contribute you know, or would be considered trammeling and, you know, I, we talked about whether the massive restoration efforts would be considered that, um, right? Potentially benefiting natural, but um, this intentional manipulation of that environment. Um, in this case, maybe restoration would be seen as positive, but still an intentional ma manipulation. I'd have to think about it a little more in the context of the permit system, but in general, as far as um, <laughs> trammeling of the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness, I can unfortunately think of many examples. Um, uh, the most prominent related to um, wildlife, um, weeds. Um, so it's so it's really interesting, and I think what I've noticed is often through this analysis process, um, trammeling will uh, some of these management actions will um, come at the expense of the untrammeled quality of wilderness character. So. I don't know that I can speak eloquently to it right now. I'm glad you bring it up. And I, I think it's um, something that's kind of at the forefront of my mind, especially because it feels like we're moving into an era of managing high use, high visitation areas. And how do we kind of hold on to that nugget of wild, of untrammeled and still um, provide for all of the other things that people seek in these areas. And I don't have an answer, Pete. I just love that you bring it up. And it's something I think about a lot. And um, perhaps we could connect. It sounds like you probably have thoughts and experience. So thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, thanks, folks. I, well, Katie's reading the question for her in the chat. One last uh, point I would look make on that is when you talk about education, it's also internal. And I think a lot of other resource specialists that are not familiar with wilderness would not understand what trampling is, much less take it into account. You know, we think action. I think Lisa brought up the word action. We always are an action agency. We want to do things, but we do have to question whether we should do them. Yeah, the they um, that's a great point, Alex, for sure. Um, it's good to be action oriented, but but sometimes that action is sitting on your hands. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so in the chat, there's a question for Katie from Amanda Wheelock. And it, Amanda, if you want to come off mute and say it, that's cool. Or I can just read it to uh, the group. Yeah, I can. Uh, hi, everyone. I li actually live here in Colorado and actually just backpacked the Four Pass Loop in Katie's district this past weekend. So it's funny timing. Uh, but yeah, I use the shuttle system with Roy Park Transit Authority, which is just the local uh, public transit there. And it seemed like a great experience for me as a user, but I'm curious for the Forest Service perspective there about how that's worked. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, I would love to chat more with you about your experience, but just for folks for context, what Amanda is referencing is um, one of the primary access points for the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness is what's called the Maroon Scenic Area. And that's where that iconic shot photo was taken that I shared in my presentation. Um, incredibly high visitation as well. And part of the management of that area is a required shuttle during kind of peak daytime. So from eight to five, um, folks will take the shuttle. There's also a limited number of parking permits available. So Amanda, I think to answer your question, like how do we feel about it or, or better yet, like do we think it's meeting our goals? I think it's still er too early to tell. Um, I, think in, I think it's met some of the needs of the Marine Scenic area. Um, and I think it can be a tool in conjunction with what we're doing in the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness, but it's relatively new. And I think we're still figuring out 
how they work together with each other, knowing that they're not separate entities, right? That it's the Marin Bells scenic area in the wilderness, they, they share a boundary. People are often in, interacting with both. I just think it's still too early to tell if we're meeting, still meeting the goals of both, um, both areas and sort of the attributes of what we're managing. Um, but I think there are some, um, some positive things that we're seeing out of it and also some kind of TBD, like what do we need to tweak to again, kind of go back to that triangle of compromise to meet the resource goals, to, to meet what the visitors are wanting and expecting out of those areas and then having something that we can manage kind of separately, but together. So great question. I, I'd love to hear more, but it sounds like your experience was positive, which um, I'm happy to hear. Yeah, and another uh, question in the chat from Christy Eldwine, uh, SAWS Wilderness Specialist. Uh, are, there, are there any ways I can help my unit with funding for implementing their management plans for designated sites, education, permits, enforcement, that sort of thing? Uh, any, any resources that you all have come across that um, you'd be willing to share with the group? I'll, I'll start and Christy, I'm sorry if this is not really the direct answer that you want, but one thing that struck me listening to Alex and Lisa and then from what I learned of ours is there's so much power in telling your story. Um, and I think when when you tell tell the story and the truth, you know, a transparent story, something that that um, you feel is accurate to the area you're describing and charged with stewarding. There's a lot of power of that in that. And I think then it helps garner people's support and resources. So I know maybe what you're asking is like, where can I get money to do the thing? I don't have that answer, but what I can share is that it, when areas and people and groups and partners um, tell that story in a way that, it, that the public understands what's in it for them um, and, and what's at stake, I think, what I've seen is that can be kind of gravitational and magnetic for resources, whether that's time, energy, or money to follow. So sorry, I know that's very kind of high level, but the, the power in storytelling cannot be understated. And just seeing Lisa and Alex present just reminded me of that because I thought they did an amazing job of sharing that. So I'll stop there and other folks can jump in. So I, I can kind of explain the approach <clears throat> I took when I first got to the Monon Monongahela. You know, ideally you'd have a partner that was friends of blank wilderness and they would be in lockstep with the Forest Service and be dedicated to the same ideals. That's just not reality. In most places that doesn't just exist and you can't magically will it into existence. But what you can do is look at the partners that you currently have or there are nonprofits in the area see what their missions are, see what their niche is. A lot of times it's geographic. And maybe there's way, places you can overlap and use multiple partners, or maybe it's just a waiting game. So that's kind of what I took approach. I had in my head, if we had a partner, they could do A, B, C, D. I had a whole list of things. And then about a year ago, when we had this big increase in visitation, West Virginia Highland Conservancy came to us and expressed interest. And little did they know, I was like, oh, you're interested? Uh, well, how about this, this, this? Are you interested in doing these things? And they were, they were. So it's kind of about timing at some points. And, and again, I, I can't will these groups into existence and there's no perfect group, but you kind of work with reality and take advantage of the opportunities that you're presented with. Yeah, and I um, I think if we had a perfect answer, we'd all be in a much better place, you know, especially in the East. Um, and, and unfortunately, wilderness is a hard nut to crack in terms of funding. I've been really successful in other areas in my programming, tying national forest to outdoor recreation and economic development, but that's not something that we, we don't want to drive people to the wilderness for those reasons. So it's, it's a really tough nut to crack that takes a special funding source and a special partner. And um, I'm just so glad we have great partners in the East to help us solve these problems the best we can. Um, one last question, we're running out of time, folks. Um, but uh, <laughs> Nick, Nick Anderson from SAWS, uh, Wilderness Ranger in Linville asks, at what point is the wilderness 
uh, only a wilderness in name? Uh, and when when do we draw a line in the sand and let nature again have its place? Um, and I'll just start by saying that wilderness is a is a is a, a resource uh, that is that you know it is a lot of diff different disciplines. It's not just for people, and we're talking a lot about visitation today, um, and and a very people centric approach. But I, I would say from working with for, with Lisa and Alex, and I'm sure Katie's the same way. I feel I, I know that you all value all of the different um, benefits of the wilderness resource, um, and it's 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 a hard nut to crack. So if you guys have any. Um, insight into this or thoughts about this would love to hear it yeah i took myself off uh, mute mute to uh just call dibs not going first so <laughs> yeah i think again you know it's wilderness it is going to be increasingly hard to manage and i think we all recognize that because um visitation is not going down right um but I think that in order to keep wilderness, we have to adapt. Um, we have to be able to adapt how we manage and the tools that we manage with. And so, you know, as much as I think some of our areas need to heal, it's, it's also that challenge of, of how we do that in a way that keeps wilderness relevant at a national scale. Because if we're not relevant, then we can't have more wilderness then we'll lose what we have and so um you know it's gosh it's it's a hard job i'll just leave it at that well i will give an answer <laughs> um i think I, I try to think of it over the really really long term kind of perpetuity vision that that wilderness was drawn up with and i think I don't know that I've dated it back this up, but just from observation, it does seem like when something's named a wilderness area, it brings more attention to it. Katie was talking about telling that story. A lot of times that story is effectively told in order to get it named a wilderness. And so people know about it. And that leads to people getting there. When in reality, we all know that there's places that have no designation, no, maybe not even on a map, no name, that you can get perhaps a more wild experience than one of these wildernesses. Um, but my hope is that in the really long term, as those other places get discovered, um, maybe the luster of the wilderness name isn't quite as much of an attractant and, and that we can more effectively manage it to these ideals. And just the fact that over the long term, we know that in perpetuity, these are the ideals we're going for, and that's not going to change. I want to think in a long term that that, that will pay off. It really will, and and we'll be able to do a good job of keeping it wild. Yeah, the only thing I would add, I'll be brief, but Nick, I just feel like you summarized like what I personally think is the biggest challenge that we are we are facing. I wish I knew the answer, and I I think the answer is like a collective decision and intention on exactly what Alex and Lisa are speaking to. Like, how do we do that in perpetuity with changes um, with nothing being added to that resource. Um, so I don't know, Nick, I love the question. I don't know the answer. And I feel like you could, you just summarize like the biggest, I think, challenge that we are tasked with right now. So thanks for asking it. <laughs> um, well, that we're basically at time a little bit over. I uh, just wanted to say a sincere thanks to Lisa, Alex, and Katie for their uh, great insights and sharing their stories uh, of the places that they care for. Um, and that, you know, I think we'd welcome more questions. If you want to shoot them to, to an email, um, I can share those emails in the chat or y'all can type those in the chat. Um, and uh, and then this presentation will be up uh, on our YouTube site at the end of the week. So um, we can uh, watch all of this again, if y'all want. So um, lots of information. Thanks so much. Really appreciate y'all. Um, thanks for attending the, uh, the WSI Summer Series.
Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Lisa, Alex, oh, nice work. I'm so humbled. You're amazing. Hey, you too, man. I feel like um, we need to like keep getting together in the future and seeing how this grows and like what what changes we make, like support group, wilderness support group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, I also have to say um, that slide with Allegra in it. I took a picture and texted her while we were talking and that just made my whole day. So that was fun. Really cool. Uh, 